Finishing is something that often brings us a lot of relief, fulfillment, and joy in our lives. When we work hard or we spend so much time focused on something and it finally comes to an end, maybe I've never done this in my life, maybe you've trained to run a marathon. Months and months of training finally leading to that one day. Or maybe it was schooling. For me, schooling, especially seminary, three and a half years of, of hard work. And then at the end, I just remember this sense of just, uh, just this huge weight off of my shoulder. When we finish something, when we work hard and finish something, it is, it is a great feeling. Today, we are going to be talking about the finished work of Jesus. Now, when we understand what this means, first of all, we have to realize that this work of Jesus was planned before the universe was even created. We need to understand that God throughout the history of time, from the moment that the universe was created through the voice of God, through, through the creation of mankind, through the calling of Israel as God's chosen people, through the, the kings that came, and through the, the disobedience and the judgment that God brought, throughout all the span of history, everything was leading to what we're going to talk about today. What we're going to do is look at really the last week of the life of Jesus. Today is Palm Sunday, and we're going to talk a little bit about Palm Sunday. We're going to talk about what happened in that last week leading up to the cross. And we're going, the title of today's message is, It is Finished. And we're going to look at a number of different uh, passages in John, looking at that last week, looking at glimpses of what happened leading up to the cross. And so as we begin this look this morning, we're going to start off by, first of all, talking about expectation. Point number one is expectation. And we see this in John chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. What we see is that as Jesus was fulfilling his ministry on earth, the week that this day that we celebrate, Palm Sunday, began with Jesus entering Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, the Passover festival. And as Jesus walks towards Jerusalem, as he's going towards Jerusalem, crowds of people come out to celebrate Jesus entering into Jerusalem. And we see, we're going to see, there was great expectation. We're going to see that the crowds were so excited because they expected Jesus to come as the Messiah, to come as a king, and they were looking forward with this, with, this, um, with this excitement that God was going to fulfill his promises. We're going to also see that their expectations weren't God's plan. So as we look at this expectation, look at verse 12 of John 12. It says, the next day, the large crowd that came to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. As I mentioned already, the crowd was excited that Jesus was coming. And as we see their excitement overflow, they begin to, to grab palm branches. That's why we, we call this Palm Sunday. And, and we talk about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The crowds were all riled up, all excited, grabbing palm branches and shouting Hosanna as Jesus entered. The crowds were seeking a king. They were seeking the Messiah, the chosen one of David, the chosen line of David, to come and to rule over God's people, to, to free Israel from the oppression of the Romans. 
And, and we, this might seem weird to us, you know, grabbing palm branches, waving them and shouting. But this was actually something that was, that was done for, for Jewish heroes. You know, they, they were welcoming Jesus as a hero into Jerusalem. Um, sometimes, you know, people returning from battle, the, those who would come back, they would, they, would, they would be met with the waving of the palms and the shouting. Um, or, or it was also used in times of great rejoicing. And so you can, you can understand the crowd was just like so excited that Jesus was there and Jesus had come. And although they were expecting a king, Jesus came as a king, just not as they expected. Notice that they also yell Hosanna. And that's a word that uh, we don't typically use in our everyday life. Um, the word Hosanna means save now or salvation now. And so you can understand the people were longing, they were hoping that Jesus was coming to bring salvation. Now, once again, their mindset was, was not that Jesus would come and die on a cross. Their thought was Jesus would come to rule as a king, to bring salvation from the Romans, to establish the kingdom of Israel, to free them from their, their bondage. But this was not what Jesus came to do. And I think it's very interesting. They were expecting a king. They were crying out for salvation. And Jesus actually did all of those things. Just not in the way that they expected. This week I read an article by, um, by Margarita Turkowski, um, a psychologist who wrote How to Relinquish Unrealistic Expectations. And it talked about how we all have unrealistic expectations in our life. And so unrealistic expectations can cause great harm and, and aren't healthy. You know, she talked about in this article how when we have expectations that aren't real, they can chip away at our relationships. They can steer our lives in an unhealthy direction. Um, and they set us up for failure. You know, one of the things she talked about, and, and I can relate, is I think I had probably this expectation as I was younger. You know, the unrealistic expectation that we should be perfect in school. That, that we should always get a 100%. That's unrealistic, right? Um, sometimes we have expectations that we should, we should do things that we are just incapable of doing. And so then when we fail, we, we feel stupid, we feel, we get depressed. And this article talked about how unrealistic expectations, and I really like this. She says, assume a level of control that we don't actually have in a situation. I think here, the people of Israel didn't have unrealistic expectations. They just had the wrong expectations. They were looking for God to do something, but God had a completely different plan. All right. As we look at this passage and understand God's people, the people of Israel, were hoping, were praying, that God would send a king. That God would bring salvation. And what I think is really sad about this whole situation is that God was doing that very thing. And they just didn't get it. So this week, the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry of his life before, before he goes to the cross begins with this, this time of joy that people are, are welcoming him as a king. But yet we're going to see that as the week goes on, the expectations of the people are not going to be how they turn out. So first we see expectation. Secondly, as we, as we jump further on in the Gospel of John to John chapter 18, the second point that we're going to see today as we look at the last week of Jesus' life is we see tragedy. We go from expectation, expectations that are so high that Jesus is coming to save, that Jesus is coming to be the king. And yet at the end of this week, we see all of that fall apart. 
from the time of uh, his entry into Jerusalem on Sunday to, to Friday, we see that Jesus um, endures through some very significant things. We know that Jesus is betrayed by Judas. We know that he is brought in front of, of Herod and in front of Pilate. He is, he is tried. The Sanhedrin um, says that he is worthy of death. He's brought to Pilate. And we're going to pick up where he is speaking to Pilate. And what's interesting about Pilate is Pilate is Pilate doesn't think Jesus did anything wrong. Pilate wants to free Jesus and let him go. But he's afraid. He's afraid of the people. He's afraid that the Jews will revolt. And I think he's really afraid for his job. That if, if, if the Jews revolt, his position is in danger. And so let's look at John 18, verses 38 through 40. And it says, after this, he said to them, after the kid said this, he went back outside to the Jews and said, I find no guilt in him. So here, here's Pilate. He has the authority to free Jesus. And he says, this man is innocent. This man is not guilty. But look at verse 39. It says, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? So here, Pilate is kind of um, not really taking his responsibility as he should. If a man is innocent, what should happen? He should be released. If, if a man is innocent, he shouldn't be condemned for something he didn't do. And Pilate knows that Jesus is innocent, but he doesn't have the, the courage, he doesn't have the strength to, to give Jesus the justice that he really deserves. And so he kind of passes the responsibility onto the Jews, and he says, okay, um, at the Passover, we usually release someone to you. Do you want me to release Jesus? Look at verse 40. They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. As we see what happened in the span of a week, how Jesus was met with cries of Hosanna, how the crowds cried out with such high hopes and expectations. And at the end of the week, they basically say, Jesus is not our king. They say, we would rather see Jesus die we would rather allow a guilty man to be set free. The tragedy in this whole situation is, is, is kind of ironic as we look at it further. We see the guilty are set free. As Pilate ignores justice, as Pilate gives in to pressure, as Pilate cares more about himself and about his position, he lets the guilty go free and he condemns the innocent. As we understand what this means, I think this is a picture of, of, of really what happens beyond just Barabbas and Jesus. We, when we understand what Jesus was doing and his purpose and plan for coming to the earth, it wasn't just Barabbas that was set free. Throughout Jesus' death, he died an innocent man. He was condemned to be executed as an innocent man so that all of us who are guilty can be set free. I am... Um, one of the things I've, uh, that really is, has stuck in my mind over the years as I've, I've learned more about it is you know, one, that, that there are a lot of people who have been sent to prison that, that are innocent. 
You know, there's, there's groups like the Innocent Project who work at trying to free those who were imprisoned, um, who were convicted, and who, who were actually innocent. Um, there's, there's a group called the Death Penalty Information Center that says that since 1973, more than 165 people have been released from death row with evidence of their innocence. Isn't that amazing? That, that there are people who are condemned to, to death that are actually innocent. And the tragedy is that there are some who are exonerated after they've been executed through DNA evidence and other things. That, that when we look at that and we understand that, we think, what a tragedy. That is a horrible thing for someone to be on death row who's innocent or for someone to be executed who's innocent. But that doesn't compare at all to what Jesus did. Not only was Jesus innocent, Jesus was sinless. Not only did Jesus not deserve to be executed, but he was the model of perfection and purity. He's the son of God. He came to this earth out of love for all of us. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. This was, Jesus didn't do this in, in order to gain glory for himself. The Father didn't do this, um, although he does earn glory and fame through all that he has done. He did this out of his love for us. Because he knew that we were condemned and we could do nothing to earn God's favor. And as a result, Jesus, innocent, without sin, was sent to a cross for us. We see this week begin with this great expectation of a coming king. Towards the end of the week, we see this great tragedy of an innocent man being condemned and a guilty man being set free. And at the end of this great week that we call Holy Week, where we celebrate Jesus and his final week, his, his final week on the earth, it ends not in tragedy, although Jesus dies, but it ends in victory. Point number three, is victory. Now a lot happens between the end of John 18 and John 19 verse 28 where we're going to, to look at this morning. You know, Jesus was taken and he was crucified. We know that in the course of all that happened, Jesus was beaten, Jesus was mocked, and they nailed him to a tree. And as Jesus is there on the tree, we, we're going to look at the, on the cross, we're going to look at just the last part of his life. In John chapter 19, verse 28, it says, After this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Now, I know we're only looking at a few verses here in John 19, but something that you'll see, not only in John, but in other places, as it describes what is going on through the crucifixion of Jesus, it comes back to this idea that what happened was to fulfill the scriptures. When they cast lot for Jesus' clothes, it was done to fulfill the scriptures. When, when other things happened, such as um, no bone was broken, or when they pierced him in the side, it, it tells us in these verses that describe these events that these things were all done to fulfill Scripture. And Jesus here on the cross, as he is there, he knows that everything is, is coming to an end, that he is completing the task that God sent him to this earth to fulfill. And it says in verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now we might look at this and say, this, 
how is this a victory? How is this, how is this possibly good that an innocent man dies? But we see from Jesus' perspective that the work he had been sent to do was finished. Now, this this word, this this uh, this idea of, of finished is is very important for us to understand. This is a concept meaning um, that that it has been paid in full. The idea is, as Jesus says, it is finished. This is not a cry of defeat. Instead, this is a cry of victory that he has fully paid the price for mankind that we could never pay. That redemption has been purchased and it has been paid in full. What we see in this final week of Jesus' life is that he came to do the will of the Father and he did it perfectly. That he came to die as an innocent man on our behalf. That he came as a sacrifice for our sin to pay the price that we could never pay. And at the end of this week, He's victorious. He has done all that the Father has sent him to do. Now, a few years ago, I went um, shopping at a, a large um, um, home repair store. I'm not going to say which one it is, but uh, I was looking for some bug spray because we lived in Florida at the time and we had lots of bugs all the time. So we would have to spray on a regular basis. So I went to the shelf and I, I went to grab a big container of this bug spray. And as I took it off the shelf, the top was off, wasn't on securely. And all of this bug spray just, you know, it's liquid, you know, just spilled out all over me. It got all over my, I was wearing shorts and flip flops because it's Florida, you know. So I had it all over my leg, all over my foot, all over my clothes. It was really kind of gross. So, you know, I went and I told somebody, and so, I, the, of course, it was a big deal. The manager came out, and they had me file this report, and, you know, my skin was getting red and some of the spots where it, it had uh, spilled over on me. So, um, you know, I, it wasn't a big deal. I wasn't hurt that, you know, really significantly at all. The, the redness went away in, in a little while. But a few weeks later, I got a letter in the mail from this company. And it had a gift card, which was which was nice, you know, saying we're so sorry for all this, all this inconvenience. We're so sorry you were, you know, hurt. And so here's this gift card as a token of our, you know, whatever. Um, but at the end of this, it said this settles your complaint in full or something like that. I forget the exact wording, but the idea was this is over. Right? We no longer have any responsibility. This is done. You know, or maybe, maybe have you ever had that opportunity where you've, you've maybe paid off a mortgage or paid off a loan and you get that statement that says this is paid in full. Isn't that awesome? Now, here, here's what I want you to think about. Think about the debt of your sin. We are all sinful people. We fail so much every day. And if we would look at the scope of our life over all of the things that we've done to violate God's will, to sin, all of the times we've lied, all of the times we have treated people um, in unloving ways, all of the times we've done things that hurt God and hurt others. We put all of those things on a scale. We would be amazed at just how sinful we are. But what Jesus did on the cross was to take all of that sin. To take all of that guilt. To take all of that brokenness and harm that we have done and say that it's paid in full. Not because we are great people or because we were able to, um, to, to um, 
to honor God in such a way that he just passed over it. No, that's not how God works. God doesn't just pass over sin. Sin has to be paid. And Jesus on the cross paid the price for you and for me so that all of that guilt, all of that stain, all of that brokenness can be forgiven. And as we celebrate this week leading up to next week in Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection, we see that not, we're going to see next week that not only is the price for sin paid, but sin and death have been utterly and completely defeated. And so I just want to encourage you or, or ask you, you know, maybe you're in this situation where you look at all the things in your life. And maybe, maybe you're under the impression that I can, maybe if I just do a lot of good things, God will be happy with me. Or, or maybe, maybe you think that, that if I'm just a good person, or if, if I do, you know, if I go to church and I do these, these religious things, that God will be happy with me. But what we see from Scripture is none of those things will ever, ever, cover the guilt of our sins. That only the death of Jesus, an innocent man, could pay that price for us. And scripture says, you don't have to earn that forgiveness that Jesus paid for. It tells us that Jesus, that God gives it to us freely when we place our trust in him. The Bible tells us that this is a gift that God gives by grace through faith. And so what God wants of us is not that we become perfect people because we never will in this life. We'll never stop sinning, although we should try and try to be more and more like Christ. But that we need to trust in what he has done. We need to place our faith in his work in his finished work on the cross for us. You see, since Jesus paid that price, we don't have to keep making sacrifices over and over and over to pay for our sin. It is already covered. And this week, as we think about it, as you go about this week, thinking about Easter coming, you know, remember Jesus. Remember what he did. And I think it's important for us to remember the aspects of what he went through in this final week of his life. Where although the people were expecting one thing, Jesus did come as a king. And he did come to save. And he came to be condemned, even though he was innocent. But he did it all so that he could say it is finished. So that salvation could be purchased. So that forgiveness can be offered. So that we can be his children. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for all that you have done for us. I thank you for... I thank you that you came to this earth and that you suffered for us. I thank you that you willingly allowed yourself to be condemned in our place. And I thank you that you paid the price in full for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us at this time in our life when we have so much going on that is hard, when there is so much around us that is unsettled, I pray that you would help us to remember that you are victorious 
and that we have hope in your victory. We pray this order in your name, amen.